Many intermediate blues guitar players have the false assumption that scales are exclusively for soloing and chord voicings are exclusively for rhythm playing. It's easy to understand why we make that assumption, but today I'm going to show you how you can visualize chord voicings when soloing to play tasteful lines that highlight the changes beautifully. Here's the lick we'll be analyzing today. That is one of 126 vocabulary examples from my book, Beyond Pentatonic Blues Guitar, and it's a perfect example of how you can combine two approaches to fretboard visualization, scales and chord voicings, to play lines that flow through the one, four and five chords in a way that screams, I know what I'm doing and not, I've been playing this same minor pentatonic lick for 30 years and at this point I've all but given up trying to do anything different. So this lick is played over the turnaround, which as you'll see, is the final four bars of a 12 bar blues progression where you have all three chords, the one, four and five, played in quick succession. One bar of the five chord, one bar of the four chord, and two bars of the one chord. All three of the chords in a basic 12 bar blues progression are typically played as dominant seventh chords. In the key of A, this gives us A7 as the one chord, D7 as the four chord, and E7 as the five chord. I mentioned the structure of the turnaround already, so I'll play through it now by just strumming some dominant seventh chord voicings. All right, so the voicings that I just played for the five and four chords, E7 and D7, are the ones that I'm visualizing when I'm playing over them in that lick. The lick actually starts in bar eight, just before the start of the turnaround. So in that bar, I'm still on the one chord, A7, and I play a sequence of notes from the A blues scale, which is timed so that I land on the root note of the five chord, the note E, directly on beat one of bar nine, where the five chord appears and the turnaround begins. One, two, three. Next, I play this. So what's going on there? Well, as I said, I'm visualizing this E dominant seventh voicing. The root note is in two places here. There's one on the A string, which I just landed on, and one on the B string an octave higher. The major third is on the D string, and the flat seventh is on the G string. So this dominant seventh voicing doesn't have a fifth, but that's okay. Now, you may have noticed that when I played this part of the lick, I'm not simply arpeggiating the notes in this voicing. Right, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not just picking only the notes in the chord and nothing else. I'm also including a note that's a semitone lower, one fret lower than the major third, which is a note on the D string. So listen to me play from the start of the lick up until the last note of the five chord bar and watch the fretboard diagrams on screen to see me play this note right before I play the major third. So what is this note? It's called a flat third. And a flat third is an interval that's one semitone smaller than a major third. If you don't know what any of that means, Look at these major and minor bar chords. The major bar chord has a note on the G string that makes it sound major. This note is called a major third. The minor bar chord has a note on the G string that makes it sound minor. This note is called a minor or flat third. Now, dominant seventh chords have major thirds so why is it that I'm able to play both a major and a flat third 
over this E7 card? Well, the major third is one of the strongest card tones to target in a dominant seventh chord. But what all of your blues guitar heroes often do when targeting this chord tone in their own solos is they will precede it with what we call a passing note, a semitone lower than the target note. So here's the major third of the five chord. One semitone below it is the flat third, which you can use as a passing note as a means of getting to that major third in a creative way. If you've been playing blues for any length of time, you've no doubt played a lick over the one chord that goes something like this. These two notes on the G string are the major third of the one chord and the flat third of A, one semitone below. So you can take this flat third to major third passing note approach and apply it to all three of the chords in a 12 bar blues, since they are all the same chord type, dominant seventh chords. That's exactly what I've done over the five chord here. And it's also worth noting that the flat five of the A blues scale, which is played right before I land on the root note of the five chord, it's a semitone lower than the root note of the five chord. So here's the root of the five chord, the note E. A semitone below it is E flat or D sharp, the flat five of the A blues scale. So although it's technically played over the one chord and in that instance is technically viewed as the flat five, it could also be viewed as the passing note for the roots of the five chord. And if you were to think of it in relation to the five chord, this note D sharp would be the major seventh of E. Now, again, dominant seventh chords have a flat seventh. So you wouldn't want to lean on a major seventh for too long when playing over a dominant seventh chord which is exactly why it functions well as a passing note for the root of the chord. You're not leaning on it for very long at all. Moving on to the four chord, I take the same dominant seventh chord voicing that I visualized for the five chord, move it down two frets, and I play this. Here I'm doing the same flat third to major third passing note approach that I did with the five chord, only now with the four chord. I'm going flat third, major third, root, back to the major third, flat seventh. So getting in all the notes of that voicing. And after I've outlined the notes of the four chord, I'm heading back to the one chord with more of a scale-based approach like so. So to recap, I approach the five chord in bar eight with the A blues scale sequence of notes that land me on the root of the five chord when it appears in bar nine. I arpeggiate this E7 voicing and include the flat third passing note to target its major third. I move that voicing down two frets. I'm not strumming these voicings, but in terms of visualization, I'm moving it down two frets. And I do the same thing to highlight the four chord. Then I return to the one chord with a scale-based approach, which FYI is a combination of A major pentatonic and A minor pentatonic. If you're someone who has only ever approached soloing by visualizing scale positions, hopefully this lesson has opened your eyes to the possibilities that await you if you begin to look beyond a purely scale-based and purely minor pentatonic-based approach to blues soloing. So what's the next step to take? Well, there are two options. One, for those of you who already know and trust my content, 
and another for those of you who are watching me for the first time have learned something new in this lesson but are still a bit skeptical about buying from me. For the people who know me already, I'd recommend purchasing my book Beyond Pentatonic Blues Guitar on Amazon. The link is in the description box, it's insanely affordable and I promise you it is not just another cookie cutter approach to blues guitar instruction that doesn't tell you anything you don't already know. None of us need to read yet another stock chapter on the BB King box. This is a comprehensive guide to breaking out of the minor pentatonic rut that has halted the progress of countless aspiring blues guitarists around the world. Through learning about soloing approaches that include scales but also go beyond them, you'll learn how to improvise solos that highlight the changes in a way that sounds tasteful and sophisticated. If you're watching me for the first time, I'd recommend watching the free blues improvisation masterclass that I have linked in the description box. It's an hour long, it's insanely detailed with fretboard diagrams and graphics. It takes you through a 12 bar solo and introduces you to many of the approaches from the book to give you a real taste of what you will learn if you choose to buy it. So if you don't like the masterclass, then the book just isn't right for you and that's fine. We don't have to be friends. I won't take it to heart. Thank you for watching. I'll see you again soon.